Okay, hello and welcome back. So in today's video, we're going to be continuing our exploration of differential equations. And today we'll be focusing on Cauchy-Euler differential equations. So in a previous video, in fact, the last video we released, uh, we talked about constant coefficient differential equations, uh, particularly second order constant coefficient differential equations that were homogeneous. Uh, today we're going to stick with the theme of second order differential equations, and they'll still be uh, homogeneous. Now we're dealing with different types of coefficients. Um, so yeah, let's, let's begin. So this is our general form of a second order differential equation, where we have a y double prime, a y prime, and a y term. Remember, y is going to be some sort of function of x that we're trying to solve for that makes this equation equal to 0, in this case, because it's homogeneous. However, as coefficients to y, or multiplied with y, we sometimes have some other functions of x. So like I said, you can think of them as coefficients or just um, other functions. When we talked about constant coefficient differential equations, uh, we had that these functions, a of x, b of x, and c of x, were all constant. So here we let them be a, b, and c for real numbers a, b, and c. Uh, and that's where the name constant coefficient differential equations came from, because our functions were simply constant. However, as we know, not all coefficients are going to be like that. We are going to run into situations where our coefficients are not constants. So today we'll be looking at a special case of these differential equations where some of our coefficients are of a particular form, and we can solve them in a unique way, and these are called Cauchy-Euler differential equations. So Cauchy-Euler differential equations say that our y double prime term, if the function in front of it is a x squared, where a is some sort of real number. And if the y prime, the term in front of that, is b x, where b is some real number, and in front of the y is just a constant value, if we have these three things, then we have a Cauchy-Euler differential equation. And we can solve it in a particular manner, which we'll be exploring today. Um, so this is the main way of detecting if you have a Cauchy-Euler differential equation. Look at your coefficients, see if it matches this form, x squared, x, and then a constant. So before we get into how to solve Cauchy-Euler differential equations, I will very quickly run through what we did for constant coefficient differential equations, though I highly suggest you watch that video because we go really in depth and cover everything. This is going to be very, very quick. So for constant coefficient differential equations, this is the differential equation we were looking at, where a, b, and c are some sort of constant value, some sort of real numbers. And the way we would solve these is, well, we first analyzed a couple of differential equations of this form. And we said all of the solutions were of some form of e to some power of x. So we said the way we'll solve this is we'll guess that our answer looks like this, y equals e to the kx. And we'll find the appropriate value of k that solves the differential equation. So you take the derivative and the second derivative and substitute back into there. And we get this here. We can factor out the e to the kx term multiplied with this polynomial. And that must be equal to 0. We argue that this cannot be 0 because it's an exponential term. So it must be this term that's equal to 0. We called this polynomial the auxiliary polynomial. And solving the polynomial, finding its roots, gave us our solution. So for example, if our auxiliary polynomial had two distinct real value roots, then our solution looked like this, y equals c1e to the r1x plus c2e to the r2x. And we saw some other cases in which our roots were complex or in the case where we only had one root and we handled those. But this, this idea, this procedure is going to come into play today when we talk about Cauchy-Euler differential equations because the process is quite similar. And so let's take a look at a Cauchy-Euler differential equation. So this is an example right here. And the first thing we would want to do is ensure that it is a Cauchy-Euler differential equation. And the way I'll do that is in front of the y double prime term, I see an x squared, which matches over there. Just let a equal 1. In front of the y prime, I have a 3x, which does match that, let b equal 3. And here we have a negative 15y, which matches that, let c equal negative 15. So this is indeed Cauchy-Euler. And uh, just like we did in the constant coefficient differential equations video, the way we're going to do this video is we'll start by uh, checking through a solution. So right now, I'm going to provide you a solution to this differential equation. So immediately, when we look at this solution, it should look kind of familiar. We should be feeling OK with it. 
And the reason why is that it's very similar to our solution for constant coefficient differential equations, at least in this case with two real value solutions, in that we have two solutions that are being summed together with c1 and c2 as coefficients. Uh, in other words, we're taking a linear combination of two solutions. And both of them are exponential in some way. Here we had e to some power of x. Here we have x to some power. So there are quite a bit of similarities between these two solutions. And this is good because, in fact, Cauchy-Euler differential equations are solved very similarly to constant coefficient. And we'll see this process repeat itself, just with slightly different things. So we can check this uh, solution to be true just by taking the derivatives and then substituting in. But what I'd rather do instead is check a particular solution. So not just the general solution, but I'm going to choose values of c1 and c2 and see if that's a solution. So we'll check if y equals x cubed is a solution. Uh, it should be. If this is correct, then we let c1 equal 1 and c2 equal 0, and x cubed should be a solution. But we'll check to be sure. This means that y prime equals 3x squared, and y double prime equals 6x. And now we can substitute in. So we have x squared times y pr double prime, which is 6x, plus 3x times y prime, which is 3x squared, minus 15 times y, which we said was x cubed. And we're hoping that equals 0. And we can multiply this, so this becomes 6x cubed plus, this is 9x cubed, minus 15x cubed, and we're hoping that equals 0. And indeed, these sum to 0, and we're good. So x cubed is a solution. We're going to do the same thing now, except we're just going to write things slightly differently. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is to give intuition as to how we're going to solve these differential equations. So we'll still test y equal to x cubed. Ooh, I don't like the sound of that. Uh, chalk's being weird. But now when we write y prime, we're actually going to write out what we do when we take the derivative, meaning we're going to write out the power rule. So the coefficient of 3 is fine. And then what we do is we take the exponent that was originally there, and we subtract 1 to it. Uh, and you know we'll get 3x squared. But I'm, I'm going to leave it like this. And then y double prime, you can think of taking the derivative of this, or rather, let's just pretend we're taking the derivative of 3x squared. That'll be 6x. But now the power is going to be 2 minus 1 when we take the derivative. Um, which will be 1, but I'm going to leave it in terms of the 3. So it's really 3 minus 2. And that should make sense, right? When we take the first derivative, the power decreases by 1. But when we take the second derivative, it's going to de decrease 1 more. So the net change is 2. And now let's substitute back in. Uh, so we have x squared times y double prime, which is now 6x to the 3 minus 2, plus 3x times y prime, which is 3x to the 3 minus 1, minus 15x cubed. And we'll, we'll multiply this in. But I want to keep the arithmetic of exponents preserved. So when we multiply these two, the exponent is going to add. So this exponent will add 2 to it. So it becomes x to the 3 minus 2 plus 2. Here, our coefficient is 9. And again, the exponent will add, because these have the same base and we're multiplying. So this is x to the 3 minus 1 plus 1. And this is still 15x cubed. And now we see that, OK, this minus 2 and this plus 2 cancel. So we're left with 6x cubed plus these two cancel, 9x cubed minus 15x cubed, and that equals 0. Why did I do this? Well, when we did constant coefficient differential equations, when explaining why we guessed e to the kx, the argument was that whatever function of y we choose, when we plug it in there and take its derivatives, 
we want the three terms, being these three terms, to be like terms. So that way we could add them together and make them equal to 0. We wanted them to be like. And we leveraged the fact that when you take the derivative of an exponential function, the exponential part will be preserved. We'll get some sort of coefficient or some sort of product with it, but that exponential part is still going to remain there when you take the derivatives. So when we plug it back in, we'll have like terms. That same argument cannot be made with Cauchy-Euler differential equations, because now we're multiplying by a non-constant. If you were to put in some sort of exponential function there, the exponential part would preserve, but we're now multiplying it by some other non-constant, so they won't be like terms. So instead, we're levering, leveraging the fact here that when we take the power rule, our exponent decreases by 1 each time. And this is important for Cauchy-Euler differential equations, because we see the coefficients of y double prime, y prime, and y, they have x to some power. And the way you look at it, you can think of like the coefficient of y has an x to the 0 term, the coefficient of y prime has an x to the 1 term, and the coefficient of y double prime has an x squared term. So when we take the derivatives here, we're losing 1 power in the exponent, but we're regaining it when we multiply by the function in front of it. Therefore, we'll be left with like terms right here, and they can combine together to be 0. This is all to say, when we're doing Cauchy-Euler differential equations, the main thing we're leveraging here is the power rule. And this should hopefully give you some insight in how we're going to solve them. And we'll do an example basically now, I think. OK, so now let's get started with solving Cauchy-Euler differential equations. So I've rewritten here. Now we're just looking at Cauchy-Euler. So this is the general form of a Cauchy-Euler differential equation. And with constant coefficient differential equations, I like, gave you a game plan of what to do, how to, of how to solve them. For now, I'm kind of just leaving it uh, to your own imagination. But maybe I'll fill in the details later. I've, I've given us a starting point. We're going to guess as our solution y equals x to the r. So once again, with these differential equations, we're guessing the solution and then hoping that it's correct and finding the correct values for it. Um, so we're guessing x to the r instead of e to the kx. And the reason for this is basically what we argued earlier, that we're leveraging the power rule and how that's being used with taking the derivatives and their coefficients being increasing powers of x. So let's just start by doing that and see what happens, where we go from there. So of course, here we see an example. This should hopefully be familiar, because I gave you the solution to it just a couple moments ago. So let's do so. We'll guess that y equals x to the r. Now of course, we want to substitute in there and find what our value of r is, because this is an incomplete solution. So let's take the first derivative. So this will be rx to the r minus 1 by the power rule. And y double prime is going to be r times r minus 1 x to the r minus 2, again, by the power rule. And so now let's substitute back in. So we have x squared times y double prime. We're adding to that 3x times y prime, which we said is rx to the r minus 1, and then finally subtracting 15y. So now we see the power rule coming into action. Here, the power of x has been decreased by 2 since we've taken the derivative twice, but that's going to be amended by the fact that our coefficient had an x squared term. Similarly here, we, it's been decreased by 1, but it'll be amended because we have a coefficient of x. And this is also going to be an x to the r term. So it'll be like terms in a sense. So multiplying this together, we get r times r minus 1 x to the r plus 3r x to the r minus 15 x to the r. And that's going to equal 0. 
Okay, again, we're trying to find what our value of r is here. So since all of these terms have an x to the r factor, let's take that out. And we're left with r times r minus 1 plus 3r minus 15. That equals 0. And we can expand this out a little bit. r times r is r squared. This is minus r, but then we're adding 3r, so this is plus 2r, minus 15, that equals 0. And this should be feeling kind of similar to constant coefficient differential equations, where we factored something out. With constant coefficient differential equations, we factor out the e to the kx term. Here, we're factoring out the x to the r. And this should also be familiar, like some sort of, perhaps, auxiliary polynomial. And so when we did constant coefficient differential equations, we said, hey, this term can't be 0 because it's exponential, so we need the polynomial to be equal to 0. And the same argument will be made here. This x to the r term cannot be 0, so we must need the auxiliary polynomial to be equal to 0. So let's find the values of r that make that true. So this nicely factors into r plus 5 times r minus 3 equal to 0, which means r equals negative 5, or r equals 3 suffices. And this is good, because our guess was y equals x to the r, and we were trying to find which values of r work. So that means something like x to the negative 5 would work, and x cubed would work, which is good, because that's the solution we tested. And again, just as we did with constant coefficient differential equations, we have these two independent solutions. To, so to form our overall solution, we take a linear combination of the two. And that's our answer. So right away, we should be feeling a little bit comfortable with this, hopefully, because of the amount of parallels to constant coefficient differential equations, uh, where we make some sort of guess, which is some sort of exponential function, take the derivatives, plug it back in, factor out the like term. We're left with an auxiliary polynomial, solve the auxiliary polynomial, and then construct our solutions based off of that. So it's very similar. It's just the thing that we're guessing is a little bit different. So I've decided to fill in some of the extra details here, but it's kind of self-explanatory. After we guess y equals x to the r, we find the auxiliary polynomial after plugging in and factoring out the x to the r, get the roots of the auxiliary polynomial, and then use the roots to construct the solution. So like I said, very similar to constant coefficient differential equations. Now, if there's so many similarities, there are some other things we talked about in that video that we should also be thinking about here. Um, that is, for example, when we did the constant coefficient differential equations, our answer form differed based off of the roots of our uh, auxiliary polynomial. For example, um, for example, we said that if the discriminant of the auxiliary polynomial is greater than 0, then we had two roots that were real, and our solution was y equals c1 e to the r1x plus c2 e to the r2x. But then there was also the case where if the discriminant was less than 0, then we had imaginary roots. Then our solution was some form of sines and cosines, and it looked a bit different. And then there was also the case where if it was equal to 0, then we had like c1 e to the r1x plus c2x e to the r1x. And there were you know, three cases to consider. So as such, that naturally follows with uh, Cauchy-Euler differential equations that there will be some other cases we have to consider when the discriminant of the auxiliary polynomial is uh, perhaps less than 0 or equal to 0. So we just explored the case where the discriminant was greater than 0. Uh, just to show that, this was our auxiliary polynomial. Uh, the discriminant is equal to b squared minus 4ac b in this case is 2, so 2 squared is 4. 
and then minus 4 times a is 1, so that's still 4. 4 times negative 15 is negative 60. We're subtracting a negative 60, so we add it, and that's greater than 0. So we'll, we'll, let's explore some cases where the discriminant is not greater than 0. OK, so here we see another differential equation. Uh, of course, it's second order, as we're used to. And we can just look at it. It's not constant coefficient. Um, but it is going to be Cauchy-Euler, because it follows our form ax squared bx c. Uh, so we'll follow our standard procedure for Cauchy-Euler differential equations, where we begin by making our guess. So we'll guess that y equals x to the r. We'll take the first derivative, so we have something to substitute. So that's going to be rx v r minus 1. And then the second derivative is r times r minus 1, x to the r minus 2. And again, we will substitute in. So this is starting to feel potentially a bit repetitive, because it feels like we were just substituting these exact same things in the previous example. And indeed, we were. Um, they were exactly the same, no difference, which is kind of why I enjoy um, Cauchy-Euler differential equations. So this is what we get when we substitute. We can multiply to combine similar terms. So this is r times r minus 1, x to the r, minus r x to the r, plus 26 x to the r, Following our procedure, it tells us to find the auxiliary polynomial. So that's only done by factoring out the x to the r term. Minus r plus 26. And let's expand the inside a little bit. So this is r squared minus r minus another r is minus 2r plus 26. And that's going to be equal to 0. OK, so now we want to solve this auxiliary polynomial, find the values of r that make this equal to 0. And unfortunately, this is not easily factorable. Uh, you can try, but it's, it's not super pleasant. So to solve for the values of r, we'll resort to the quadratic equation. Uh, so this is going to be r equals negative b, which is 2 plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 4, minus 4ac, so 4 times 1 is 4, times 26 is 104, all of this over 2, uh, 2a, which is just 1 in this case. Um, OK, so this will be equal to 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 100, all over 2. We can rewrite the square root of negative 100 as the square root of 100 times the square root of negative 1. This is all over 2. The square root of 100 is 10. The square root of negative 1 is i over 2. So our two values of r are 1 plus the square root of or plus 5i and 1 minus 5i. And ideally, we'd like to do a similar thing, where we just want to construct our solution from the roots. And we would say, OK, y is equal to c1x to the 1 plus 5i plus c2x to the 1 minus 5i. And again, we run into basically the same issue that we did with constant coefficient differential equations, where we wanted our solutions to be real valued. And unfortunately, this is not, because we have uh, complex numbers in the exponent. 1 plus 5i and 1 minus 5i are complex numbers. So with constant coefficient differential equations, we utilized Euler's formula, which took e to the i x or some function of that, and then converted that into cosines and sines. And then we just took the real parts of it. So we'll do something similar, except we can't immediately apply Euler's formula, because Euler's formula works well when we have e as the base. Right now, we have x. So for that, 
we will use another helpful theorem. Okay, so this is what we'll use, and I'll just sort of walk through what I wrote here. We have x to some complex number, and we want to somehow reduce that. So the way we'll do it is we want to eventually use Euler's formula. So we're looking for e as our base. So we'll rewrite x as e to the ln of x, those two are equivalent. And that's going to be raised to the a plus bi power, because that's still there. So that's equivalent to e to the product of those two values, just by uh, rules of exponents. Um, so we can distribute this ln of x into a and bi, so we're left with e to the a ln of x plus bi ln of x. Um, and we're adding two numbers here in a power, so we can think of that as the product of two separate entities, e to the a ln of x times e to the bi ln of x. And this is nice because e to the a ln of x is a real number. Uh, this is purely real, nothing complex about it whereas e to the bi ln of x is complex because there's an imaginary term there. This is nice because we can now use Euler's formula on this. We have an i and then some sort of function of x. So when we do that, this is the equivalent of e to the bi ln of x. Uh, so this e to the a ln of x stays out, and we're multiplying that with cosine of b ln of x plus i sine b ln of x. Um, lastly, we can deal with this term on its own uh, by rules of logarithms, a ln of x is equivalent to ln of x to the a. I'll just rewrite it. And then e to the ln of uh, x to the a, the e and the ln cancel, and we're left with x to the a. So that's why this reduces to x to the a. And we're left with that. And this looks a lot more friendly. Uh, by how we know Euler's formula works and how we handle constant coefficient differential equations with complex solutions. Uh, so we can now use what we've gathered here on our roots and then just take the real parts. Um, so if we were to do that, let's see what happens. So we have x to the 1 plus 5i is going to be equal to, just plug it into there, x to the a is just x to the 1 multiplied with cosine of b ln of x, which is 5 ln of x, plus i sine 5 ln of x. And then x to the 1 minus 5i is going to be x to the 1, because a is 1. Here we have cosine of negative 5 ln of x plus i sine negative 5 ln of x. And again, we're going to take a uh, linear combination of these two. So it would be nice if like, these cosines and sine terms were similar. So to do that, we'll use the evenness of the cosine function to say that cosine of negative 5 ln of x is equal to cosine of 5 ln of x. And the oddness of the sine function to say positive sine of negative 5 ln of x is equal to negative sine of 5 ln of x. So now when we take a linear combination, we can rewrite it as c1x to the, eh, you know what? I'll just distribute this in as I'm writing it. Cosine of 5 ln of x plus c1x i sine 5 ln of x. And we add to that c2 of the second one. And now we can group like terms. So we have c1 plus c2, x cosine 5 ln of x plus, ah, shoot, this is a minus sign. c1 minus c2, x i sine 5 ln of x. Uh, C1 and C2 are constants, but I don't really care what the constants are, so I can just rewrite this sum as its own constant, which I'll call C1. And then similar for the difference, I don't really care what these are. All I know is that it's a constant, so I'll call that C2. 
And lastly, just as we did for constant coefficient differential equations, we'll drop the i, just consider the real value solutions. We explained why we could do this a little bit more in that video. The simple argument is that uh, since any sort of multiple of this is going to still be a solution, we can take whatever it was, xi sine of that, divided by i, uh, which will still be a solution, and then take real value multiples of that to get our real solution. And that's going to be our answer. So again, pretty similar to constant coefficient differential equations, uh, wherein our solution looks very similar. It still has cosines and sines when our roots were complex numbers. Um, and again, we used Euler's formula just in a little bit of a complex way, because we had to reduce it to a form where we could apply Euler's formula. Um, but again, this should hopefully be feeling very familiar, because it's very similar to constant coefficient differential equations. Cool. That was the second example. We've seen one where the discriminant was greater than 0. This one, the discriminant was less than 0. Um, just to verify, this is our auxiliary polynomial. b squared minus 4ac is going to be negative 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 26 is 104. That's negative 100, which is less than 0. So let's see an example now where the discriminant is equal to 0. OK, so one more example. This is what it is. Again, let's verify that it's Cauchy-Euler. 4x squared, good. Negative 8x, good. Plus 9, good. Cauchy-Euler. And so we proceed as normal. We will guess our solution of y equals x to the r. First derivative is rx to the r minus 1. Second derivative is r r minus 1 x to the r minus 2. So that should hopefully be second nature at this point. And again, we substitute 4x squared times y double prime minus 8x times y prime rx to the r minus 1 plus 9y, which is just x to the r. We want that equal to 0. Can multiply this out. So 4r r r minus 1 x to the r minus 8r x to the r plus 9 x to the r equals 0. Factor out your x to the r. 4r r, r minus 1 minus 8r plus 9 equal to 0. And then just let's expand this a little bit further. 4r squared. This is minus 4r minus 8r is minus 12r plus 9 equal to 0. And of course, we want this auxiliary polynomial to be equal to 0. And so this one actually factors quite nicely uh, into 2r minus 3 times 2r minus 3, which means that r is going to be equal to 3 halves. And that's our only root um, with multiplicity 2. So with constant coefficient differential equations, when we ran into this situation, we still considered um, one solution being c1e to the r1x. But we added in a second term with the same power, except we multiplied it with an x. And I didn't really give an explanation for that, just because it's a little bit convoluted, and I didn't want that video to be too long. Uh, and I'm going to do the same thing here. So again, we'll still have the solution c1x to the 3 halves, as we normally would. Um, but we're going to add on another solution. The question is, what will that solution look like? It'll be similar in that we have a coefficient. We're using the same x to the 3 halves, except again, we'll multiply it with something. The question is, what do we multiply it by? Well, maybe you'll guess x, just because it was the same thing with constant coefficient differential equations. Um, but that's not quite right, because these two would combine into x to the 5 halves. Uh, and you can kind of see that 
that would imply that five halves should probably make our auxiliary polynomial equal to zero, but that's simply not the case. Um, so we don't multiply with x. Instead, we're going to be multiplying by the natural log of x. The reason for this comes from something called reduction of order. Um, this is not something I want to talk about in this video. However, if there are a lot of questions about it and there is demand for a video on it, then I can happily create one. Um, but I think the main thing to know is with Cauchy-Euler, when you run into the case with one root with multiplicity 2, you take two solutions. The second one looks similar, just multiply by ln of x. With constant coefficient, we multiply by x. Uh, so that was this case. And again, you can verify the discriminant is equal to 0. b squared is going to be negative 12 squared, which is 144. Minus 4 times 4 is 16. 16 by 9 is 144. So that's equal to 0. So that's our third case. And so there you go. That's the third example. OK, so we'll conclude today's video by just going over a summary of what we found. And just like with constant coefficient differential equations, the summary is essentially based off of the discriminant of the auxiliary polynomial. So um, there's quite a, a bit of work to get to the uh, auxiliary polynomial this time, because you're dealing with derivatives of x to the r, and the coefficients will change as you're taking the derivatives. Um, so subtle things will change in the auxiliary polynomial. But once you get that, you can take a look at your discriminant and find the roots of it and basically construct your solution. So we showed that if the discriminant is greater than 0, then we're going to have two distinct real value roots as the solutions to the auxiliary polynomial. And our solution will look like this, c1 x to the r1 plus c2 x to the r2. If the discriminant is less than 0, then we will have two distinct roots to the polynomial. However, these will be complex numbers, uh, meaning they'll have an imaginary term to them. Uh, namely, they'll look like this. The first root will be a plus bi, and the other one will be a minus bi. Note that these a and b will actually be the same a and b, uh, just to, due to how the quadratic equation works. And then our solution will look like this. And this comes from Euler's formula that we did earlier. So this looks like x to the a times c1 cosine b ln of x plus c2 sine b ln of x. So this occurs with imaginary roots and discriminant less than 0. Finally, if the discriminant is equal to 0, then we have one root, which is a real value root. And that's the only root of the auxiliary polynomial. And our solution will be c1 x to the r1 as normal plus c2 x to the r1. This should be an r1 times the natural log of x. So we're multiplying by that additional factor. And that's basically all you need to know about Cauchy-Euler differential equations. I really like Cauchy-Euler differential equations just because um, I really like the understanding of why we're guessing x to the r and how it interacts with the power rule and things like that. I find that really satisfying when I'm solving these problems. Um, but for you, I hope you find them interesting because of how similar they are to constant coefficient differential equations. If you have constant coefficient differential equations mastered, this should be a breeze to you. Um, so there you go. This is a subset of differential equations where the coefficients are not constants. They're more complex functions of x. And in future videos, we'll explore uh, more methods of solving these differential equations where we'll have less of a constraint on what the coefficients are. So those will be really powerful tools. So stay tuned for those videos. Um, that's about it for this one, so thank you for watching, and as always, take care.